Welcome to the Teaching Bites Podcast. Here are your hosts, Fred and Sharon Jaravada. Hi, my name is Fred Jaravada, and welcome to the Teaching Bites Show, where we connect you with people and ideas to take your teaching to the next level. I'm your host, Fred Jaravada. Today, our special guest is Caroline Zoba. She's a former colleague of mine who has extensive experience in teaching in boys' schools, girls' schools, and also in co-ed schools all around the country, and even has experience teaching in Africa. Now, this is our first Skype interview in our show. After figuring out all the technical stuff and how to record Skype interviews, I'm glad to say it actually worked. Yeah, there are some sound issues like echoes and delays, but it turned out really well. Okay, enough of me talking. Let's find out how Caroline succeeds in teaching. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Today, we have a special guest, and her name is Miss Caroline Zoba. And I used to work with her. She was a former colleague of mine here in San Francisco. And now she has moved to New York City. And today, we're interviewing her about her experience and her um, outlook and insights that she has that she's going to share with us today. Good afternoon, Caroline. Hi, Fred. Nice How are you to be doing? speaking with you. I'm great. You're doing well. <laughs> now I'm catching you at the end of your day, right? That's correct. Yep. Just had a full day with my boys and getting ready to relax for the evening. <laughs> cool. <laughs> All right. So we won't take up too much, too much of your time. All right. So, Caroline, so share with the audience your story, your, your quick bio of how you got to where you are today. Okay. Well, I, uh, I am currently teaching third grade at an all-boys school in New York City. And I have, I'm in my 12th year of teaching, and I've really taught all over the United States and also spent a summer teaching in Africa. So I have a wide variety of experiences, and uh, I've taught uh, co-ed, I've taught all girls, I've taught all boys, I've taught private, public, Catholic, so I really have a wide variety of experiences um, and finally have found myself here in New York City. I've been here for two and a half years and I'm loving it. That's cool. That's so cool. Although we really miss you here in San Francisco. I miss you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I miss the girls too. <laughs> you miss the girls? Okay. The uh, the. Uh, the students or the other teachers? Everything. You know, I, of course, I really love where I am now, but I was just the other day looking back through some letters that somehow I came across that my sweet little third grade girls had written to me for my birthday. That's <laughs> cool. You, know, you, you, hear some, you hear some different things from girls than from eight year old boys. <laughs> well, that's one thing I want to talk to you about the differences between boys and girls. Okay. And you said you're also, have, you have a lot of experience also teaching boys and girls together, right? Correct. That's right. So that's a unique thing I want to hear about, and I'm sure our audience wants to get some insights also. Okay, so how did you get into teaching? Well, I actually come from a long line of teachers. My grandma was a teacher, my mom was a teacher, and I can remember being five years old, working in my mom's classroom, trying to help out. She was a kindergarten teacher and living in Dallas, Texas at the time, and she worked in a, in a church. And so after Sunday school, I'd run up and steal chalk from the attic of the church. <laughs> but, you know, you it's You stole sort of, from a church? I, I did. I did. I stole chalk. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> um, but it's, it kind of, for me, has always... I guess has felt sort of like a calling. I've just, I've never been able to picture myself doing anything else. Um, and I uh, got my credential at Colorado College so while I was in college and started as an assistant teacher in Indianapolis uh, right out of college. So I was 22 years old teaching a class of third graders as an assistant and thinking, do these people really trust me with their children? Um, but I've, you know, I've been doing it ever since, and I've, I've loved it, every minute of it. Now, what's the one thing you'd, you wish you'd have known before you started teaching? You know, I think 
uh, reflecting back on my early years of teaching, I was my first experience as a lead teacher was teaching kindergarten. And I remember there being a lot of worksheets and a lot of thinking that the kids had to be writing things down to be learning. And at this point in my career, I've realized that kids learn so well through just interacting with one another and experiencing things, getting up and doing things. And I, I wish that I had known that a little bit more. I think mm-hmm. I would have... Um, it's nice to not feel like you have to take notes on everything. You have to have a worksheet to get a concept across. And it's a lot more fun when you take that piece out of the puzzle. Share with us that time when you figured out or that aha moment, what I like to say. What was that aha moment that you realized that teaching was definitely for you? You know, I, I think that that just started uh, when I was – working as an assistant at a private school in Indianapolis and just getting really positive feedback from the other teachers that I worked with. Um, And I realized, wow, maybe this is for me. Um, It seemed to come sort of naturally to me, but I think definitely receiving the positive feedback from the teachers that I looked up to so much um, as a, you know, a lot of people start out as an assistant Mm -hmm. and, you need that positive feedback. And I'm sure that I was screwing up (laughs) left and right every day. Um, But to hear you're doing a really good job and wow, you, you know how to lead this group and you know, the things that you're doing are effective with the students. It was hearing that, that made me feel like, okay, this is it. (laughs) That was it, right? Okay. Very cool. Yes. I agree with you that especially starting off as an associate or an assistant and you get that Mm -hmm. feedback Mm -hmm. I mean, I got that also, and it just really inspired me to keep keep going. Yeah, you know, and it's tricky. I think uh, I have an assistant now, and he's incredible, and I've worked with assistants over the years, and it is tricky as a lead. Sometimes we are so wrapped up in what we're doing and and stressed about things, and, you know, we forget to give that that positive feedback that's so needed. Can you you run quickly about um, your, um, the demographics of your school? Um, sure. So it's an all boys school. It's a K through 12 school. Um, and it's a, uh, very high socioeconomic level. Um, there is, I actually often feel like it is the most, my classroom is the most diverse classroom that I have ever worked in. Hmm. Um, however, it's, we don't have a lot of African American students at our school. Um, so that is, that is missing a bit from Mm -hmm. um, the structure of the classroom. Right. Is there a movement or is there um, talk about how to include more African-Americans and and, and students of color? Absolutely. For the past, uh, well, the entire time that I've been working at my school, we have been working with somebody exploring the African-American experience in private schools. And um, we have really looked at a lot of, with group work and how to build on um, kids' strengths, how to elevate the status of certain individuals in the classroom based on academics or based on, um, you know, an African-American student, how to elevate their status. Um, But it is something that we talk about on a daily basis and that I have started doing more and more in my classroom. Last week I did a a lesson on implicit bias and I was terrified to teach the lesson. Implicit Um, bias. Yeah. So, so just thinking about the, um, you know, the prejudices, the judgment, the judgments that we make without even really realizing that we carry these things. Um, I gave an example to start with of, of elderly people and Mm -hmm. how, you know, we might, we have these different judgments that we make about the elderly. They might not be able to hear as well. They, you know, certain things and how really it's not fair to make those assumptions. I I couldn't go up to every elderly person and speak to them really loudly because (laughs) <laughs> that could be offensive. <laughs> you might get smacked with your cane. <laughs> right. So it was. It was really. It was a. Uh, it was really a growing experience for me because yeah. it challenged me. I was terrified that I was going to 
you know, totally bomb this lesson and open up this conversation that was going to backfire. Right. right. W- would you consider that one of your most challenging moments? Absolutely. I mm-hmm. think, um, you know, especially third grade is a, an age where the kids are ready to have some of these difficult conversations. And I think that when it comes to like, really making sure that kids feel included and feel valued. And especially when you're talking about issues of race and issues of, you know, just things that come up where it's very easy to offend somebody um, and it can make a lasting impact. And to just to think that I am going to be responsible for starting this conversation. Right. <laughs> it's a lot of pressure. It's a lot um, of pressure. But it was it was it ended up being a great lesson and just really being a starting point for us to now be able to have lots more conversations. Oh, that's amazing. That's a, that is a pretty challenging thing, and, and it, it's something I have to figure out. Every, you know, a lot of times also. Um, okay, so how do you motivate your students? Well, I think especially being at an all boys school. The everything that I do in planning the curriculum and planning the lessons that I'm going to teach to the boys, I'm thinking about their interests. And I think that is really how I motivate them by thinking, what are they going to want to do? Um, can can my, you give us an example? Yeah, my, my particular class right now, they are so into music. <laughs> and really? it's, it's been a challenge. Because what, kind of, what kind of music? You know, that's the challenging part. It's it's all of the current stuff. And I finally started Taylor feeling Swift. like... Taylor Swift? Taylor Swift? It, it's like, it, there's rap music. Yeah. And there's, you know, and it's like, I'm for the first time feeling a little bit old because <laughs> I don't know these songs. <laughs> right. But as a responsible teacher... I have to I have to preview the music that they're playing. I have to right. I have to be in the know with these songs. Mm-hmm. So with my group of boys, they're so into music. We just did a lesson today where we were analyzing lyrics with music and they were glued to me. Wow. <laughs> I mean, they just they were so into it and it that's that was a really effective way with them to to teach a lesson. Um we also, a lot of our writing units um, at the school I'm teaching are catered to boys' interest. So one of the genres that we wanted to tackle was personal memoirs. That's not typically something in the past that, that we had tried with boys that they were interested in. They didn't want to write about memories of, from their life. So we tweaked it and we made it ouch, oops, and uh-oh stories, times Ooh. that they've hurt themselves <laughs> right. or you know gotten into trouble. And... All of a sudden, they loved it. They wanted to write all about it. Um, so cool. it's, I think, motivating. It's just so important to think about what did, what are they, what are they interested in? Right. Um, now, how about the flip side with girls? You have extensive experience with girls, also, and with that, also, you had a mixed classroom, also. Mm-hmm. What are the similarities or differences, and how do you motivate your students, or are they all the same, or? You know, it was interesting when I when I worked at Convent of the Sacred Heart and working with girls, I always felt like girls are they're such pleasers and they entered the classroom at the beginning of the year and they would look at me and they already loved me. I didn't even have to open my mouth or say wow. anything, you know? They loved me. As soon as they, you walked in. Literally, ah. Yeah. And they just I mean when I was looking back through these letters, it was like, I love you because of your hair. Like, what? Um, and I, so I felt like in terms of motivating girls, they just, it was, it was different because, you know, of course we were thinking about in planning lessons, their interests. Um, and, but they also just, they wanted to please, they wanted to do well um, because they wanted to do well for their teacher or for their parents. And with boys, I've always felt like, they come in on the first day and they're all looking at me like, who are you? Right, right. <laughs> and why, why are you up there? Why do I have to listen to you? And so I've realized in the past two years with boys especially the importance of, it's, it, I don't know if I would say proving myself to them, but putting much more effort towards building strong relationships with them at the beginning of the year just yes. through 
you know, hanging out with them, getting to know mm-hmm. them, chatting with them, um, because it's not that instant <laughs> love connection that that I saw with the girls. Can you share with us a time when an oh well moment where you tried something, but you had to like skip it or just move on from it? An yes. oh well moment. Uh, uh, I immediately think about trying to use technology. <laughs> <laughs> give me some examples. <laughs> I, I can give you about a million examples here. No, it's, you know, I definitely, after 12 years of teaching, feel so much more comfortable using technology in my classroom, but I had to also learn to be comfortable with saying, oh, well, <laughs> right. it's not going to work today. All of a sudden, our internet doesn't seem to be working, or, you know, this, I just can't, the sound decided to go down. Um, especially trying to use airplay. And sometimes it just seems like anytime there's an extra connection. Um, that's not to say that I don't try to use technology anymore because I use it all the time. I just, I always know that I, I think I've, when I started using technology, which really probably was that convent of the sacred heart when I was doing more and more with it, I would get so nervous and I felt like, I had to be the expert on whatever it was that I was presenting. So if we were going to do Puppet Pals on the iPad or we were going to use iMovie, I had to figure it out, do my own project, know all the ins and outs. And the way that I approach it now is if we're going to use iMovie, I build in a 20-minute session the day before. Here's how you get to iMovie. Here's a couple quick basics. Now you guys go try it out and teach me. Right. right. <laughs> Tell me some things. And so I always try to build in that, you know, it can be a quick 15, 20 minute or even introducing it during, we do, um, I think because of New York City and the lack of playgrounds, we do a lot of indoor recess. We call it choice time. So it's in the classroom. And so there's a lot of iPad play. Um, But it's really made a difference in the anxiety that I feel as I'm approaching lessons now using technology because, you know, if it doesn't work, I can usually, by this point now, think of a different way to do it. Um, or I can just say, you know what, I can't model it for you right here, but I know you can go do it. Right. Um, so that's helped a lot with that. So you've learned how to have a plan B, plan I've, C. Oh, yes. All the way down, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and not take it so, being an educational techno, uh, innovation coordinator myself, mm-hmm. I've also learned, I don't have to learn everything. Mm-hmm. At that moment, right? I don't need to learn right. and show everything. Our kids, they can figure it out. Right. Yeah. And they they often, even if I do try to be the expert on it, they still know more than me. <laughs> they do know more than us. Yes, it's true. So yeah. we just, as teachers, and you probably agree with us, we just have to learn to let go. Yes. Bit, right? No, it's very, you know, that, I remember being at convent and we started doing things on the um, computers in the hallway. And all of a sudden I looked over and the kids had, I still don't know how to do this, but they flipped the screen so the screen was black and the the letters were white. And I was like, <laughs> how they did that? And so now, if that happened, who cares? <laughs> like, I just had to be able to kind of let them have more fun with with the you know the different technology tools. Right. Okay. So, Caroline, what is your number one biggest challenge in teaching? I think that I've probably touched on this a little bit before but it's I think it's really just staying current I think there's our world is at such a fast pace and especially working with eight and nine year old boys and many of them have older brothers and are exposed to so many things so much earlier than we were as children and I I have to stay current with the songs that they're listening to the apps, you know, that they're exposed to, the movies they're watching, the books. Um, but I think it's so important because it's also our responsibility as teachers to help them navigate through all of this crazy stuff that's being thrown at them. And to be able to help them do that, we have to be educated ourselves. Right. We have to know what things they're, they're facing. Okay, so um, we mentioned it back in the top of the show. Can you talk about your experience teaching in Africa? Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. 
So when I was working at uh, Convent of the Sacred Heart, we had um, the Sacred Heart schools are a network of schools, as you know, and uh, we had a connection with a school in Uganda. And I remember we always, you know, we're doing little projects and fundraisers and writing letters to some kids out there. And I felt like, okay, we're doing so much. I want to go. I want to see this place. So I went uh, to Uganda. I went to Jinja, Uganda, and I lived in a convent (laughs) for a month. And um, each day I would go to St. Bernadette's was the name of the school. It was a co-ed school, and it was just so different from anything I had ever experienced before. There were 70 to 100 children in one class, and, you know, some of them, sometimes they'd be sharing a seat. In a class of 70 kids, there might be 12 textbooks that they're all kind of trying to crowd around and look at, and it was definitely a different style of teaching. It was, you know, it was really an incredible experience and terrifying at the same Mm -hmm. time. Um, and I am an incredibly independent person and I really had to depend on the nuns that I was living with and, you know, the teachers that were in charge of the school. And that was tough for me to have to depend so much on somebody else. But I remember when I was out there, anytime that I was going to go in and teach a lesson, the teachers were like, can we just come watch? They all wanted to leave their classrooms and just come observe just to see, you know, how I would approach a lesson. Right. One of the biggest things that I did out there was they had a library and a lot of schools from all over the U.S. had donated great supplies, science Mm -hmm. materials, books, all kinds of things. And it all just sat in boxes because they didn't know what to do with it, but they also Uh didn't want to break anything or... You know, they felt like, well, here's this. If we use it, though, here's a coloring book. But if we color in it. There's no more coloring book. Yeah. So one of the things that I really tried to do was just open all the boxes and show them how they could use the materials, uh, whether it be a science kit, mixing colors, you know, or just Mm -hmm. whatever it was. And and trying to encourage them to color in the books, (laughs) rip the pages out. Right. Wow. Would you do that again? Um, you know, I, I would or, do that or, again. Or would have you done it earlier in your career? Yeah, I, I really, it was, it was tough for me mm-hmm. uh, being out there by myself that right. whole experience. But I, I feel like I really grew from it, and um, I think that that's character characterized a lot of the things that I've done in my life. Mm-hmm. Moving a million times, right. I I love a challenge, and I I always get these crazy ideas of oh now I'll go here. <laughs> I'll you know I seem to put some difficult things in my path and then kind of work my way through it. Um, so I th- I I think I would do something similar to that again. Okay. Okay. So Caroline, so what motivates you to get through your teaching day? Well. It's definitely the kids. <laughs> they mm-hmm. are, they make me laugh all day long. And one of the things that I love about starting each new school year is figuring, you know, getting this whole new kind of crop of students. And they're all so unique. And they each have, you know, some their strengths and their weaknesses. And I love trying to figure out how are we going to help each of these kids? How are we going to challenge them more if they're ready for for more and they're bored with the math curriculum? Or how am I going to really reach this child to help them um, to achieve the things that are expected of them? And I think that that is what is most motivating for me is when I feel like I've really reached a kid and I feel like I've been working my butt off and I've, feel like I've tried 10 million different things and I've gone home exhausted and frustrated and I, you know, don't, I feel like I'm not reaching them. And all of a sudden one day something clicks and it's like, yes, (laughs) this worked. (laughs) It could be a small thing like that, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I remember I had a student last year who one day I just, this idea popped into my head to take his pencil away and make him write with a pen. (laughs) Hmm. 
And all of a sudden, it was like a whole new student in writing time. Oh, wow. And, okay. you know, just little tweaks that there's nothing like that is written in a textbook. There's not going to be something you learn about that. But you, just, I think as a teacher, you just start to try different little things and figure out what works. Okay, so Caroline, share with us a tada moment, something you're proud of. So recently, I have done a bit of curriculum work. Uh, curriculum is definitely one of the things that I am most passionate about in teaching. And um, we've done a lot with our social studies units in third grade. And uh, last summer, I rewrote our Dutch unit. I learned Dutch. all about Dutch. I learned all about the Dutch coming to New Amsterdam when I moved to New York. Wow, okay. <laughs> yep. And, uh, you know, I... One of the things that we've been working a lot with at my school is um, doing group work activities and not in the sense of, oh, you're going to go work in a group, <laughs> but really thinking about um, what are the, the skills involved to be able to successfully work together in a group, mm -hmm. having jobs, <laughs> having the kids thinking about what their strengths are and how we can incorporate that into the group that we're work they're working with. So I was as I was rewriting this Dutch unit, I was trying to think about some group work activities, um, trying to just, again, think about what motivates the boys. And so I was so incredibly proud of this unit that I put together. There were scavenger hunts. <laughs> there were hands-on feeling beaver fur to learn about why the Dutch actually were attracted to New Amsterdam. Mm. Um, but the kind of the culminating project was to recreate New Amsterdam, a 3D model. And we had in our class, we had city contractors who led the whole project and they came up with a list of what's everything that, you know, that we really need in our New Amsterdam. They assigned jobs, then they would kind of go around and That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> check in with like kids. That. And it was one of the coolest things that I've ever watched because we had done so many activities leading up to this point to mm -hmm. really get them ready to be able to do some student-led things, to work successfully in groups together. And they had so much fun, and they created, I mean, it covered our entire bulletin board, but it was this 3D model. So there were homes, and there were um, boats in the water, and wow. horses going through, and gardens, oh. and they loved it and they took so much more away from the unit than I think they ever had in the past because they just, they remembered it more. Oh, that's so cool. I can just by hearing the, uh, the passion in your voice, you can tell this is a ta-da <laughs> moment. That's cool. And, and the listeners don't see this, but I can see uh, Caroline and she's waving her <laughs> arms all over the place. <laughs> you are passionate about this. This is your ta-da moment. I, that's so I cool. sure am. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, is there anything coming up that you're excited about? Yes, I am actually making a move next year. I'm moving to second grade. <laughs> second grade, okay. Uh, yeah, big move. Uh, yeah, so I have been teaching third grade for, this is, I guess, my sixth year in a row, if you combine convent and right. the school where I am now. And, you know, one of the things that... Um, that I think is unique about my teaching experience is I've, I've moved every few years and I don't know if it's that I get bored easily <laughs> or if there's something more there, but I love taking on a new challenge right. and I really have loved the third grade um, at my current school. I have a wonderful teaching partner who has pushed me so much and we've designed some really amazing things in our curriculum. But I just, I feel like I'm, again, at a point where I'm ready for an, a new challenge. And mm -hmm. so I am so excited to be moving to second grade and having this entire new curriculum to, to think about and to figure out what I can add to it. And we also study the five boroughs of New York City, which the five boroughs. Okay. I'm a little bit of a nerd, so <laughs> I'm excited to learn more about each borough. Um, That's cool. Yeah. But also just getting back with the with the really little ones because mm -hmm. uh, I taught kindergarten for many years and you know third grade is very different from kindergarten and second grade I think they still they're still pretty sweet and they still give you hugs and um, so I'm looking forward to that. 
share with us, with the teachers listening to the show, a time-saving tip, something you do that you cut corners or somehow you save time in your workday? I would definitely say organization. Um, I am, I, you know, I've always wished that I could be one of those teachers who could be a little bit more, you know, just on the fly, we're going to do this, and I'm not. <laughs> I am... I am definitely a teacher who is planned out and I like to have my lesson plan written up. And I often don't even then go off of it, but it just helps me to organize what we're going to do. Mm-hmm. So because of that, <laughs> it helps to be incredibly organized too. Whenever I teach a lesson, I take notes afterwards about what mm-hmm. works, what didn't work. I go back to my plan book and I write little things like, don't ever do this again. <laughs> you know, this was really tough. They needed more time with this. And it just helps me so much. I think the next year as I'm going back and I'm looking through things so that you're not reinventing the wheel every year, Mm -hmm. if you can stay on top of, you know, the things that you're doing and be organized at the time, it can save a lot of time in the future. (laughs) Yes. Uh, So you do that in the physical space in your your classroom and also, like you said, in your, your lesson plans and also in technology. I'm assuming, right? Right, absolutely. Okay, so what's your favorite tech tool? What's your favorite, as of late, what's your favorite tech tool? I feel like I do a lot on the iPads, and um, we've been trying out a lot of new apps like Fonto, um, Puppet Pals. I really like using Explain Everything. The boys really like that one. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're constantly trying new ones. Every time, right. you know, just something. Uh, what we often do is we'll have, you know, we'll write a social studies lesson or a writing, and then we'll get together with our tech coordinator and, and just kind of say, you know, I feel like this could be a place that could really be enhanced by using some sort of technology. And I don't know what it is. <laughs> and they'll often give us suggestions, and then we can try some different things out. Um, and iMovie, we've been doing a lot recently with digital stories. And so um, I was in a profession- professional development group two years ago where we created digital stories all year, just working with teachers. Mm-hmm. Created a lovely story about my sisters and I growing up. Um, so we then brought that to the third grade. And one of the projects that we do that we're actually working on right now are family histories. And the boys learn about um, somebody in their family. Um, they may have met them. They may have, you know, never gotten the opportunity to meet them. But they learn a lot about them. They learn a specific story about them. The boys write the story. And then they bring in a couple of images. And we look at a lot of really powerful digital stories um, to use as models. And then the boys spend a couple of days creating this digital story so they're bringing their images in Mm -hmm. they have headphones and little microphones and they're reading their stories then they go through all the editing process they add music in the background and they're incredible the end product that's amazing that's a very cool project yeah yeah I i like i like those kind of projects where the kids they get to know family members or the people around around them and they dig mm-hmm. deep. Yes. That's very cool. Okay. And parents parents have always told us that they it's one of their favorite things that we mm-hmm. do because it just starts conversations at home. They're not right. required to do a whole lot at home with it mm-hmm. except to just gather information. Right. And then they use the technology to capture all that and present it. Yes. So the kids get to edit that and present that. That's awesome. Yes. That's really awesome. Okay, so <clears throat> is there a website that you like to go to get ideas or resource? My resource is my tech coordinator. <laughs> awesome. I, I love tech coordinators. It, it really is, though. It's, <laughs> you know, I find that, you know, I could go onto the computer and try to research things. Google or I, it, yeah. Or I could go to the experts and just say, like, tell me what, you know, tell me about this. I'm definitely. Not somebody, though, who's scared to just go on to something and try to figure it out myself. I was, um, we're creating a project right now where we're going to take a mystery tour around the world. (laughs) A mystery tour. A mystery tour. And the boys are each going to get a pedometer. 
and mm. we're going to provide some for families as well. So I was trying to figure out how, I mean, I had this great vision in my head of everybody from the parents going on and entering their steps onto some form and, and then having a big map so that they could track our, and then I, I wanted to have clues and some would be video clues about where we're going next. Wow. Sort of like a, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so I just sort of explained this vision to my tech coordinator and they figured out how to help me and make it happen. <laughs> they, bring, and, they can bring it down to reality. Yes. <laughs> right. I learned all about Google Forms right. and now Forms. I'm so excited to go create this form and put mm-hmm. my personal touches and I learned about the themes page. <laughs> but yes. I just found that that is that can be really helpful just to share ideas with people yeah. and share my vision and then play around. Exactly. All right, Caroline, what's the best advice that you ever received? And in turn, what what advice do you give to teachers? The best advice that I have ever received is from my mom, who was a teacher. And she told me my first year and then has told me over and over every year since, you can't make every second of every day the best moment (laughs) for these kids (laughs) because that is often how I approach everything you know Mm. I've got to make every single lesson amazing and incredible Uh, but she's absolutely right because trying to to set that expectation for yourself is you know you're gonna just drive yourself crazy as I've often done over the years um and I think though that she's also right and that it doesn't need to be perfect and it's more important that I am just present for my boys and, and they're, you know, not distracted by grading or having a conversation with another teacher, but I'm just there with them. And, you know, I might present something and the, the lesson bombs, but, mm-hmm. who, you know, who really cares as long right, as these right. boys feel loved and feel valued and, you know, are, they're going to be fine. They're going to be fine. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And, and I guess it's good also – for the students to see even the teachers make mistakes. Right. Yeah, right. absolutely. Oh, they love it when I make a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the advice that I give to other teachers is to not, you know, I think just because I've moved so many times and I see so much value in moving grade levels, that's the advice that I often give people is just don't be afraid to start over in a new grade level. And, you know, and start with a brand new curriculum. You can do it. (laughs) You can, you know, tackle anything and it will be a new challenge and it will be some extra work, but you'll grow so much from it. Um, You know, I've worked at, I don't even know how many different schools, but I've, I've taken something from each school that I've worked at. And I, when I'm teaching now, when I'm writing lessons, I can definitely pick out things that I've learned from all of these different teachers along the way and different students along the way. And that wouldn't have happened if I just stayed in one spot. Um, so it's, you know, it's just to challenge yourself to get out there, to move around. <laughs> to move around. No, that's great advice. That is hugely great advice. Uh, Caroline, I know you have a race coming up, right? Oh, no. <laughs> no I was oh, are you taking a break? Well, the marathon kind of burned me out this year. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's been a two-week break, so it's okay. not, you know. But I uh, I am signed up for the for the marathon for next year in New York City. New York City Marathon. I'm not fully committing, although now that I'm <laughs> broadcasting this. <laughs> well, now you have to prove to everyone that you're you know, actually right? doing it now, right? <laughs> well, I just wanted to wish you good luck with that. Thank you. <laughs> I think about you at mile 21 where I was All like, right. oh, I didn't want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> but but a lot of teachers know you're doing it, so you better do it. You better finish it. <laughs> Caroline, thank you so much for your time and your insights and your experience, sharing our experiences with us and our audience. It's very, very helpful, and we really enjoyed it. 
Anytime, Fred. I'm happy to chat with you. <laughs> okay. Maybe in, in about five years or so, we'll, we'll catch up again on the <laughs> God, podcast. I'm almost scared to think what I'd be doing then. <laughs> Maybe you'd be teaching in Europe. We don't know, right? Maybe. <laughs> okay. All right, Caroline. Thank you so much. And we'll see you soon. Great. Thanks, Fred. Thank you for listening to the Teaching Bites podcast at www.teachingbites.com.